in the human being individually it is this what Sri Aurobindo refers to as the Hellenic ideal of the body being harmonious in a rich and active life organized body well ordered and the senses fully effective in the life force a strong and sane that is balanced vitality and in the mind an enlightened development of the power of the intellect these are the three things which go which form the Hellenic ideal which the modern world holds up as our ultimate potential and we have already looked ahead and seen these three are the domains successively of Agni who creates the form in matter Vayu who drives the life energies and Indra who presides over the mental world these are the three powers working in us cosmic because they preside over all these three domains in the cosmos at the same time they work in us to organize these, these three domains in our evolution and the other gods not mentioned here are other powers working behind also in the same movement so human evolution has now reached this poise where a full developed healthy mental vital and physical life has now been attained the gods who are pushing this evolutionary movement in us are now strong happy luminous they have conquered the world and now they enjoy themselves and between themselves they divide their domains but if this were all if evolution stops here there is no possibility of going further because the gods themselves are unable to see what else comes this is an important point we must recognize the gods here in the Upanishads are different from the gods in the Vedas in this one distinction in the Vedas the gods know their oneness with the divine they live in that oneness and represent and express it in their different actions but in the Upanishads the focus is much more on the working of the gods in the universe and in us and therefore the oneness behind has as if receded and so the gods themselves in their drive in their running in their enthusiasm of their victory do not know that behind them is the one who is in them who is their strength and power and who acts through them and so the gods themselves have to grow and awaken to their own diviner source and potential even as we in whom the gods are organizing our evolution and our awakening we too have to grow so in a sense the gods are closer because they are more free we awaken to the gods with their help we achieve our completeness here but also with their help we turn to know that which otherwise is unknowable to us and so within us these powers of the gods are successively pushed forward to try to go beyond to that which is behind of which we do not yet know <clears throat> so the parable now has to be seen on both these levels of our personal growth and development and evolution but also the awakening of the powers in the cosmos the gods to their own greater further evolution which of course helps us in our evolution so when they are enjoying themselves Sri Aurobindo explains for the next verse but such is not the full intention of Brahman in the universe or in the creature that it's the intention is not simply that they should stop here yes they should come to this also but then the greatness of the gods is his own victory and greatness 
but it is only given in order that man may grow nearer to the point at which his faculties will be strong enough to go beyond themselves and realize the transcendent. So the goal of our awakening into fully rational and complete mental life is that the mind should be able to go beyond to something greater and to the transcendence. For this purpose, the first step is to focus on this development of the individual and a complete development of the individual. In our individual evolution, you can see how this takes place. In the early phase of our teenage years, we're still developing the body, the life energies, the mind is just beginning to come into its own. At some point when the mind is fully formed, we are an organized separate individual, suddenly we feel the lack. What am I here for? What is my life meant to be? I need something more to feel fulfilled. I need to go beyond myself to feel my own life is worthwhile. This may take some decades often when a person has asserted their individuality in life, conquered the domain of life, become great in their skills and capacities, in their dominion of resources, people. You have created a great business or you have gone up the hierarchy in your promotions and then suddenly, now what? I remember once meeting a person who had reached the highest strata in the bureaucracy in one of the most uh, prominent departments involving finances and he was due to retire in two months and he said to me, I've reached the highest that I could in my career and now I look ahead and I ask what? Where I have to go? What do I have to do? Suddenly there's this emptiness, something missing. And we find this happening in every human being's life, individually. Different degrees, different forms. But the same thing happens also in the collective evolution of humanity. Where once we have reached the acme of the rational development, the modern age characterized by the intellect, promises to organize perfection in life, bring harmony, solve all problems, ensure there is no lack and so on. All the promises made a hundred years ago. But when finally there is this full development, you are left with the question, what now? And you feel a lack, something is missing. This transition is assisted from the other side by that which we next need to know. The very fact that we have come to this edge, we feel that, but we are unable to know it because our powers of knowledge are not developed beyond this edge. So we have come to the edge and suddenly there is an emptiness because our powers of knowledge cannot cross beyond. We are as if on the precipice and what is before us is a vast chasm, a hollow into which you can fall and lose yourself. This is often the sense. Or everything we have developed now suddenly fails and we are unable to proceed. Again the question comes, how do we move forward? What is there greater? Because something is needed, otherwise we are unhappy. So not only in our development we reach that edge, but on the other side, that which we need to now know, it comes forward equally to assist in moving forward. The Divine reaches out as if an arm to hold you and draw you to Himself. Therefore, Brahman manifests Himself before the exultant Gods in their well-ordered world and puts to them by His silence the heart-shaking, the world-shaking question. 
So when he comes forward like this, when he reaches out, obviously it is not the whole of him, but whatever they are able to feel of his presence, but he puts himself forward without expressing himself. If he were to express himself, then it would be in the domain of their knowledge, in the domain of their capacity to know, and they would only catch that. And it would be themselves that they would see. By not expressing themselves, he is beyond their capacity to know. That's when they realize their lack. You see, it's a very important idea. As long as we think we have all, if the divine were to manifest in our existing capacity, we would quickly claim that and say, I have grown in light. I have become more intelligent, more powerful, more harmonious and beautiful. Because that has come into you. When that stops short of entering you and is just there on the edge, you feel what you are lacking needs to be now developed beyond your limitation. And so he comes there, puts to them by his silence the question. And the question is, he says, heart shaking and world shaking. Again, reminding us of both the individual and the collective. Heart shaking on an individual level when suddenly, now what? I miss something or I feel there is but I do not know what and I am helpless, unable to find it or know it. And world shaking when the same thing happens in the collective evolution and suddenly the whole of humanity is at this. As you see the situation today in the world, now what? How will we survive? Will we survive? Is there something more? Is there a way out? Or are we to end and perish here? Something there which you are unable to grasp and if you cannot grasp it, it is as if you lose yourself because that thing exists independent of you. And so the question, in if you are all, then what am I? For see, I am, and I am here. And so to the gods who represent, remember, the two facets, the two aspects of the evolutionary push, one side pushing towards the Brahman, aiming towards the Absolute but never reaching it, but pointing in that direction, the goodness. And the other side by negation, denying the insufficiency of every forward step, this is not it, this is not it, and so breaking what we call the negative aspect. Both of these fail in knowing that. Neither the goodness can see, ah, this is myself or my height or my perfection, nor the negative can see, this is what I am seeking for, against whom everything else is insufficient. Neither of them can see it because they are all stuck in their limitation, in their sidedness, in the duality. And so to them, that represents their annihilation. It is as if in relation to their greatness, that is so far beyond that against it, they cease to be. So, though he manifests, he does not reveal himself, but is seen and felt by them as a vague and tremendous presence. The Yaksha, Demon, the Spirit, the Unknown Power, the Terrible, capital T, the Terrible Beyond Good and Evil, for whom good and evil are instruments towards his final self-expression. And so suddenly, after all this perfectly ordered development of the gods, they have set their balance. Here is something beyond good and evil. Literally, their dissolution. And that's why they even experience a kind of a fear. Then, there is alarm and confusion in the Divine Assembly. They feel a demand and a menace. On the other side of the evil, the possibility of monstrous and appalling powers yet unknown and unmastered, which may 
wreck the fair world they have built, upheave and shatter to pieces the brilliant harmony of the intellect, the aesthetic mind, the moral nature, the vital desires, the body and senses which they have with such labor established. And this is on the other side of the evil. And equally, on the other side of the good, the demand of things unknown, which are beyond all these, and therefore are equally a menace. Since the little which is realized cannot stand against the much that is unrealized, cannot shut out the vast, the infinite that presses against the fragile walls we have erected to define and shelter our limited being and pleasure. Brahman presents itself to them as the unknown, capital U. The gods knew not what was this daemon. And so they put forward the three deities one after another to know who he is. But this text now what Sri Aurobindo has described in such detail captures the full sense of this single verse. Now you would wonder why? How is it that one single verse can be elaborated into this long paragraph? The reality is this that this mood of the gods and their fear and their incapacity to know is spread out across the entire chapter in the whole description. And if you read the whole thing and then come back to this verse, then you catch the full mood of it. And what Sri Aurobindo has done is he presents to you this full mood of their questing, their disturbance, their sense of fear and insufficiency. The way it is articulated in Sanskrit, it, the translation is simply this, the eternal knew their thought and appeared before them and they knew not what was this mighty daemon. In Sanskrit, some of the key words will help to amplify the feel of this. Sri Aurobindo has translated as the eternal. But in the Sanskrit, it is only tat, that. That knew their thoughts, that appeared. And when you say that in the Vedic vocabulary, as distinct from sir, that is he, it means they don't want to highlight any particular aspect. It represents the transcendent, the unknowable, and even if he leans towards you, the idea is that which is beyond our limited knowings. When he leans towards you and you know him in some relation, then we describe him as he. But then always in the he, your capacity or your approach limits what you can glimpse of him. But that is always beyond any limitation that you can impose. And so that appeared. Now what happens when the transcendent appears before you? How are you to know? If your means of knowledge are in forms, that which transcends forms, how will you know it? Formless, overwhelming, formless. So overwhelming that everything that is made of form seems to be fickle, weak, insecure, almost like foam against the depth of the ocean. So superficial. And so the sense of form becomes in front of Sir as if fading out, unreal, unable to stand on its own. Or if you try to know it by the energy, seizing, feeling energetically, what happens when your energy, which is a moving stream defined by limitation, meets the entirety of the ocean, the little current merges and is lost. In what? Formless, limitless, oceanic energy even. But it transcends even the definition of energy. So what happens to this energy in you? Unable to grasp, unable to know, unable to reach, 
feeling. And finally your mind when it comes forward, how does the mind know? by defining limits, by setting one idea against another. This is good because that is bad. And it must know in terms of relations. And when the Absolute comes before you, you have no relations. Everything collapses. You see only blankness, emptiness, vast. And so these are the three degrees by which the three powers move to meet the transcendent sir and he's, he the f description in sanskrit the word used to describe what he appears is pradur babhuva hmm? pradur babhuva now pra asserting affirming with force bhu is being. Babhuva, being in some sense of perception, not merely being, but being in a way that can be perceived in becoming. And so, Pradur Babhuva is as if he is being in a way that emphasizes, highlights, intensely present. He becomes intensely present before them. This would be the literal translation. And so, the eternal, he, sir, sir, that, sir, becomes intensely present. So, Sri Aurobindo describes it in this way. The Brahman manifests himself before the gods and puts to them by his silence the well-ordered, uh, puts to them by his silence the heart-shaking and world-shaking question. Now this question, why does Sri Aurobindo say question? Because in the text itself there is no questioning. He is simply present. In fact, the sense of question in the next verse, no, in the same verse, the sense of question is implied because in the translation, what, what was this mighty daemon? So there is something which is unable to know, but the word used, which he translates as daemon, yaksham, yaksham iti, the yaksha thus. Yaksha, Sri Aurobindo uses this in his commentary, felt by them as a vague and tremendous presence, the yaksha, capital Y, the daemon, capital D, the spirit, capital S, the unknown power, capital P, the terrible beyond good and evil. Now, Sri Aurobindo has used all these five terms for this one Sanskrit word, yaksham. And we have to go deeper into what this yaksham is. If you look at the popular understanding of the word yaksha, Often it is used to describe some beings, lower beings of the vital worlds or beings who preside over certain natural processes often associated with formations in nature like lakes or clusters of trees or hills or mountain tops. This is the common sense of the word. But if you go to the root, Yaksha, the one who in his very presence places a question, something unknown. This is the term used in the Mahabharata, for example, when Yudhishthira goes to bring water and he comes to this little pool, a pond, and the presiding deity is the Yaksha. And the Yaksha appears and says, you can only take of this water if you can answer my question. So you'll see in the story, in the popular uh, use of this term, Yaksha is one who asks a question always. So you can, it, the, as a concept, it is something, as it is used here in the Kena, a presence whose very presence leads to this question because it is unknown and in later use it is reduced to a being who is asking you a question 
But you can see how the same idea in its origin is held here. Seen and felt by them as a vague and tremendous presence, the Yaksha. Yaksha, the one who questions, who poses before you the unknown. And then he uses several other words, the daemon. This is from the Greek tradition, where also the same term is used for known divinity. Even the sense of the divine presence within us, which is unknown to us, secret, formless, seated deep within, is referred to as the daemon. Or in modern language, we would use the word spirit, which is without form and therefore not tangible or knowable. And then to further ensure that our mind understands the unknown power, because its presence impacts you. It is therefore felt as a power, but formless and therefore unknown power. And finally, the last phrase, the last word, terrible beyond good and evil, because that is the relationship the gods have when meeting this. The gods themselves representing good and evil, that being unknowable to them is beyond both and so terrible, creating this disturbance. And the this sense of disturbance is presented in the next verse when the gods say, they turn to the first one of them who is the most likely to be able to know. They said to Agni, O thou that knowest all things born, learn of this thing. What might be this mighty daemon? So the sense of the might is highlighted here. And he said, so be it. And Next, when he, then the God similarly turned, that is verse 7, then they said to Vayu, O Vayu, this discern. So the sense of discerning is the Vayu's approach, whereas Agni's approach is he knows all things that are born. See the difference in the, each of the three deities. O Vayu, this discern, what is this mighty daemon? And he said, so be it. And later, when he fails, verse 11, then they said to Indra, Master of plenitudes, get thou the knowledge. What is this mighty daemon? And he said, so be it. And all three of them, when they move to know that, they rush. So Agni, he rushed towards the eternal and he said to him and it said to him who art thou similarly vayu he rushed upon that it said to him who art thou and similarly when agni he rushed upon that that vanished from before him so in the first two cases there is a counter question from the, there is a question being raised by the uh, Yaksha, who are you when the gods come? In the third case, when Indra goes, he does not ask a question, he simply vanishes. And so we will understand this in the sense, when mind seeks to know the unknowable, it experiences this formless emptiness, that is all that it can grasp of it. But when Agni, through the physical consciousness, or Vayu, through the vital energies, reaches out, it engages with something powerful, which puts this question, what is your specific power? And each one of them puts forward their special capacity, and it challenges them to exert that capacity on it, and they fail. So all of this we will fully appreciate uh, in detail, but now when you look at this big picture, you can see the connection. There is a great power. And there is this utter failure of our greatest powers of knowledge, which have so far brought evolution to where it has come to. Everything that made us come to where we are today 
fails before this. And so finally, something, something is required which is beyond the gods. The gods themselves can only go so far in knowing that. Of the three gods in the Kena, the gods are known in their greatness according to how much closer they are able to get to that. And of the three, it is Indra who gets closest. But even after that, he needs the help of the woman, Uma, who reveals that this was the eternal. And it is his victory in which you grow in greatness. So that comes in the part four. She said to him, it is the eternal. Of the eternal is this victory in which ye shall grow to greatness. Then alone he came to know that this was the Brahman. Therefore are these gods, as it were, beyond all the other gods, even Agni and Vayu and Indra, because they came nearest to the touch of that. So the gods are actually seen in their greatness because they can approach to the divine. And when, when we turn into ourselves, what are the powers? What are the energies? What are the capacities of which can go? That is the epitome of our human development. And so we look inside ourselves and bring forward these powers. Therefore is Indra as it were beyond all the other gods because he came nearest to the touch of that because he first knew that it was the Brahman. So it is this last power, the power of the mind turning to its highest, finest, most essential poise that it knows this to be the eternal and through him the other gods acquire this knowledge. So when you see in the wording, because he first knew that it was the Brahman and then through him the knowledge extends into the rest of our being. And I'm reading far ahead, but this will be useful for us to fully appreciate. And then, now this is the indication of that, as is this flash of the lightning upon us, or as is this falling of the eyelid, so in that which is of the gods. So when this highest power reaches to know that, there is this as if a flash of the lightning revealed and the other two aspects of the explanation of the, of the experience. Then, in that which is of the self, as the motion of this mind seems to attain to that and by it afterwards, the will in the thought continually remembers it. So some part of the motion of the mind attains, then the will in the thought remembers, and then finally, the name of that is that delight. As that delight, one should follow after it. He who so knows that, towards him verily all existences yearn. Now all of this will come later in our study, but we have a preview so that we can appreciate what is happening now. In this mighty presence and its questioning, our powers seeking to go beyond their limitation surge forward one by one. One of them attains to some degree and through him is, is as if the rest of us receives and is pulled forward, awakened further. The gods grow in us and we grow with them. And this is how the next evolutionary step takes place. So first is the breakdown, the disturbance, the shaking up of the organized order so that you feel the insufficiency. And Sri Aurobindo uses this phrase, felt by them as a vague and tremendous presence, the yaksha placing the question, the daemon, the spirit, the unknown power, the terrible beyond good and evil. For whom good and evil are instruments? 
towards his final self-expression. This is the relationship. After all, it is his power in the gods which makes them victorious. So he's using them as instruments. The equivalent would be, in the human symbolism, our two arms, complementing together and both necessary if we are to hold material to shape it. One side providing a support of resistance, another side providing the movement forward. So one side pushes forward, another side provides the base of resistance against the forward movement and that's what needs, needs the dough, needs the substance to make it more malleable, more soft and responsive, awakening it. And so it is this double movement which you see in evolution of the Divine Himself. And so from two sides now we have to appreciate the relationship with the transcendent. Both are terrified but in different ways. And this is what he is describing in detail. Then there is alarm and confusion in the Divine Assembly. They feel a demand and a menace. So first of all, that thing in its very presence compels, demands a response. But it is so powerful in the demand that it threatens. You cannot ignore it. If you ignore it, the demand would break you. And on the side of evil, there is one experience. On the other side of the good, there is a different experience. Now, it's interesting to see the way he formulates it. On the side of evil, what he, the experience described is really the insufficiency of the good. And the side of the, e, of the good, what is described, is the failure of that which was always pointing out, which was evil, which was breaking the good because it was not sufficient, that itself fails. So it is as if in the description, the good and the evil are merged and they take each other's places. They become complementary and are lost in a completeness which transcends duality of good and evil. It's very interesting to see how Sri Aurobindo presents this. On the side of the evil, the possibility of monstrous and appalling powers, yet unknown and unmastered, which may wreck the fair world they have built, upheave and shatter to pieces the brilliant harmony of the intellect. So he's listing all of them the aesthetic mind, the moral nature, the vital desires, the body and senses, which they have with such labor established. Now the gods have been working to build all this. Look back at evolution. From the early emergences of unstable particles, which are almost wave-like, they are so unstable, to the stable movements of those waves, which appear now to us like particles, to their agglomeration to the formation of the life in them being expressed through single cells and so on. What a huge labor. The full value of labor you can only understand to making of a single small forward step. Sri Aurobindo gives this example of how the inner presence of the divine works to develop in a living being a habit of its instinct. Remember, at first an animal does not have an organized instinct. The instinct is growing. So the first time that the animal faces a challenging situation where its instinct is unable to resolve, it will fail, it will die, it will get eliminated, it will never get a chance to learn. Instinct is a habit built up in the species over a long period of time. So how is an animal, an individual animal in a crisis ever to know what to do if it is to live only by instinct? It cannot. In fact, instinct becomes possible because something else intervenes at that moment. So suddenly this animal is faced with a new situation. It doesn't know what to do. 
and from inside the divine presence puts forward an influence and pushes pushes the nature pushes the surface movements of his energies in a particular direction and the animal runs or responds in the way required and again and again and again in each member of the species when that similar crisis takes place over so many hundreds or thousands of years each time this inner thing comes forward nudges nudges until over time in the species all these repeated nudges have created now the habit the instinct and then the inner being need not push anymore next time in the species there is this crisis the instinct kicks the habit which was formed by the nudging kicks in and it reacts i was fascinated to see a recent some years ago now piece of research that measured the behavior of sheep as they cross a highway now consider that in the last millions of years sheep have never crossed highways they've never experienced cars going on these paved roads so for them it's a new experience if they come on the highway suddenly a car comes at such a speed they don't know what to do and they get killed so instinctively as they approach this inner push comes and it is observed that their heart starts beating faster their pulse is racing in a kind of a fear emerges now where does this fear come from when they have never experienced this something inside knows this is dangerous territory until they cross it the fear remains everything is heightened the senses are heightened they want to rush forward and cross instinct from this inner push until a, po a point will come when they will look at the highway and avoid it or know how to cross it or avoid the cars a snake going back many million years a snake must know exactly where to bite how to bite that its poison can be inserted on the nervous system of its prey so that it can stun it quickly otherwise if it cannot stun it quickly enough the prey could beat the snake down with its hooves or whatever the its own fangs it must catch the right place the cheetah when it catches a gazelle does not catch its legs it would be dragged and beaten it goes straight for the neck and the soft part of the neck by squeezing which the cheetah suddenly cannot breathe the gazelle cannot breathe and it blocks the blood flow to the brain and the gazelle stops running it's the only place you can catch that you'll make the gazelle stop running quickly how did it learn this it had to be this inner knowledge nudging nudging until the species has learned the instinct now i'm giving just a few examples now consider the entire behavior of each of these species has been built up over millions of years of this hard work by whom this presence within working through the gods and literally setting the rhythms and the order not only of individual behavior not only of species behavior but all the behavior across species and the natural balance among them what we call the balance of nature the environmental balance is something precarious finely developed across a long period of time in this way and left to itself it will function well if you intervene and break one of its key connections the whole system collapses and this is what we are seeing happening everywhere on earth today because of human intervention in a forest they cut a road passing through an entire side of the forest began to die out why because there was a species of insect which was crossing the forest to pollinate the flowers and then moving back to breed because of the road it could not cross and so the other side of the forest was not pollinated it collapsed so fragile 
and yet across millions of years so resilient because this is pushing 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 and rebuilding rebuilding the harmonies and we have only discussed life forms what about before life forms emerge the emergence of different elements and complex molecules again the gods have been working to build all those forms and setting their rhythms the so-called laws of chemistry and physics are nothing but rhythms and habits set in exactly the same way by the presence working so the reference he makes here is powers appalling powers yet unknown and unmastered which may wreck the fair world they have built and this is what we have to understand by the world they have built up and upheave and shatter to pieces the brilliant harmony which has been created and on all these levels now the harmony has been built up intellect aesthetic mind moral nature these three are belonging to the human proper and then the vital desires which you see belonging to the animal life the body and senses which you see in the plant life all of these are so valuable and of these the most valuable are these highest layers of the intellect aesthetic mind and moral nature that in the human being something has actually been organized that makes us feel guilty when we take more than we give and this feeling in the emotions has actually been organized over a long period through the animal life even but if you see the animals the first instinct is to take and then the second instinct is to share in the human being it is possible to actually reverse this and the first instinct of its mother is to give to the child and it may die in the process for the purpose of the future for the purpose of the child you may accept suffering so that your children may have a better life and this is chosen consciously not instinctively and so this is a huge development where there's a reversal of the values and something higher now can dominate and so on all of these are great achievements which have taken a very long time in the evolution suddenly something appears against which all of this is felt to be fragile which they also all these intellect aesthetic mind moral nature vital desires body and senses which they have with such labor established and so this is on the side of the evil the possibility that this is a monstrous and appalling power yet unknown and unmastered which can destroy everything so the god see this in terms of an evil on the other side on the side of the good the demand of things unknown which are beyond all these and therefore are equally a menace since the little which is realized cannot stand against the much that is unrealized cannot shut out the vast the infinite that presses against the fragile walls we have erected so this is actually from a perspective that is good because it is so much more that we have now to realize but against which everything we have so far built will be overwhelmed this is in fact part of the problem you will see in human development today the moment we get to some level of order some level of harmony some thing good built up we are afraid of progress because progress will force us to break what is built i was very interested to hear from somebody who helps startups to develop he explained how initially the startups make great progress they are extremely innovative very flexible and adaptive and then afterwards the very same people become fixed and rigid and unable to change why because at first there's nothing to lose you can throw yourself at risk what will you lose because you have nothing but the moment you've gained something and organized it and built it now if you throw yourself at risk you may lose everything you have 
and so you're afraid to move forward and at that point two things can happen either a blow comes which breaks it by force and then you're forced to, to rebuild automatically now on a new level because you have meanwhile evolved and your needs are now much greater because you have to overcome this danger or internally the thing breaks down quarrels conflicts unable to hold harmony because the world has moved forward and you have fallen behind the whole thing breaks down and collapses and you see this repeatedly in any creation whether it be a business whether it be a civilization or even in your individual life the nice ordered rhythm of your day which you have created either a crisis comes which breaks and you form a new rhythm or your rhythm itself degrades to a point where it becomes irrelevant and you collapse or you're forced to change it and so this is the other side on the side of the good there's such a great demand being made you have to catch up with this new world this new possibility waiting to emerge and against what pressing against the fragile walls we have erected to define and sh shelter our limited being and pleasure this limited form that we have bound ourselves to i give an example here the intellect for example when that appears suddenly your intellect says oh intellect is such an insufficient power there is a greater power of knowledge of an intuition etc and all that i have built up through my logic and rationality becomes meaningless the fear in front of the divine i will use the word science in front of the divine science the mental science or rational science is afraid because it means all the laws we have built up all the complex formula and explanations we have created are meaningless because the divine science says that all this is merely habit there is no such thing as law and all these habits can be shaped reshaped recast by the conscious will of the individual or the cosmic being because the cosmic being chose to move in these rhythms you observe them and claim them to be laws which are compelling but the moment you awaken in consciousness you can override the laws just like that by willing it suddenly all the rigid science we have built up all the knowledge all these thousands of books and researches appear to be a waste so science stops on this edge and refuses to look at the possibility that consciousness comes first this is one of the edges where modern science is blocked as long as consciousness was a product of my laws i'm happy with it because i can catch consciousness with my laws the moment you say consciousness comes first my laws are incidental then the scientist backs off hey, this is not science this is philosophy this is religion i refuse to look at it and so even the evidence that consciousness is prior is ignored by the scientist i was in a conference last year where one of the most uh, respected scientists working in the field of parapsychology with the most meticulous technical scientific methods presented all the chief and all that he the creation a person a situation and objects all this has been documented undeniably in the most rigorous experiments over 30 years at least and so somebody asked him why don't you go and tell all this to the media it will revolutionize the thinking in the whole world and he said we have done that again and again we have done that the media is not interested they don't want to hear they don't want to publicize and other scientists they don't even want to read or acknowledge he didn't explain why but this is the reality they don't want to why it shakes up your whole world now this is true of the intellect it's true of aesthetics it's true of your morality what is spirituality it goes beyond morality there is neither good nor evil both are equally instruments for the spiritual action and something within us goes back oh, you mean you can be evil also in the appearance of when shri krishna gives his uh, vast revelation cosmic being to arjuna 
There's this one side where he sees all these wonderful things and on the other side he sees all the forms of the asuric, demonic and evil functioning of the world equally on a cosmic scale. scale. It is an action of the divine and he's terrified by that. So much so he tells uh, Shri Krishna, enough of this now, stop this revelation and come back to your conventional four-armed form which at least I can relate to more easily. And so there's a complete breakdown of everything we can be. All the wonderful things and good things we have achieved, everything breaks down before the transcendent, before the absolute. Therefore it is a menace even on the side of the good. So on the side of the evil it is a menace because it demands It demands that you grow more. On the other side, on the side of the good, it is a menace because it is as if destroying and throwing into worthlessness all this effort. The fragile walls we have erected to define and shelter our limited being and pleasure. So far, we never saw these as fragile walls. We saw this as our expansion in the universe, our conquest of the world for our enjoyment and greatness. But in relation to that, it is suddenly found to be so small, so tiny and so fragile. Almost as if we have been sheltering ourselves in narrow limitations. The gods knew not what was this demon. And the full impact of this is felt in this way. Now this is exactly what happens to us when we experience the presence of the immensity of the self. Even as a presence, we are so overwhelmed, either we experience fear, which is the most common, the ego feels it is going to be destroyed, what if I stop breathing, what if I lose myself, what if I don't come back from my deep concentration, there's this sense of fear, or on the other side, suddenly I feel so small, so tiny, so worthless, so unreal, I just want to extinguish myself and get into that. Forget all this world, forget all that I have done. Everything is meaningless. I let go of the world. It takes one of these two forms and both of these are described in this. But that is not the intention of the divine also. That's why the divine does not reveal himself too soon. He reveals only as much as needed for these small steps that bring us to our perfection, physical, vital and mental perfection. And then he reveals a little more and that little more is enough to shake up all this. But once the individual is sufficiently formed and built, you cannot escape your individuality. So you're forced now to face this with what you have. If it appeared too soon, you would perhaps not even form the individual. You would start short and say, I want to abandon myself in that. But now you cannot, you're formed. So you have to protect all the wonderful things that have been built up. And so you put forward your agencies of knowledge one by one to know. And that is what we will take up next, where Sri Aurobindo describes what happens when Agni comes forward. So all this is only verse 2. The Eternal knew their thought and appeared before them. And they knew not what was this mighty daemon. We continue this next Sunday.